years jumping the germanium is is twice as likely as the silicon, and the silicon is half is, is twice as likely as the gallium arsenide. And so and, 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 and really it's even more dramatic because you can see it goes from 13 to 10 to 6. So it's really three to four is a magnitude difference in just that 0.3 electron volt discrepancy. So my arm can't draw that many vectors. Uh, so they're donating and then this is very nice. If you understand this concept, then this should make sense. So what's happening here? If you had to explain this in band diagrams, how would you answer that? What's going on here, ionization? Uh, looks like we're looking at an n-type material dope 10 to the 15. So, my band diagram 1 is going to be a donor level. And at 0 Kelvin, that's what it looks like. Boring, right? At 50 Kelvin, so zero Kelvin or something down here, like nothing's going on. 50 Kelvin, maybe a few of these have popped up. Creating electrons. Right. So as the KT that I mentioned earlier, KT, as this gets hotter and hotter, as it goes up, the energy, the ability for this to hop gets larger and larger, and so then it, it, the, the carry concentration goes higher and higher and higher. But eventually it saturates the air, plateaus, because now at some point every donor has donated, and I've run out of donors, I don't have any more. So that probably happens in the first 50 to 100 Kelvin, actually. So by the time I get to room temperature at 300, if this is a good dopant that's nice and shallow, then it's completely uh, done its thing and it saturates. And then what's happening here? So this is the second band diagram. First one was boring. Second one was the donors are donating. And what's the third band diagram? All of them are going to be on top. Yeah, so then I've got, I've got. And so then this is happening so, uh, such high probability that, um, that it becomes intrinsic. Yes? So you can just go from right to left. Because it's yeah, this is inverse temperature. So this is cold. And this is hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought intrinsic was the top, like the hottest part. Of yes, it is hot. So I thought that was like the standard. I'm like, oh, it's the same. Like that's where it's going to be at that temperature. Yeah, because this is going to be uh, n is going to be uh, the n sub. Uh, let me see. This is going to be the n from the. Uh, hot, let me see how to write this. N plus. So this will be n sub d plus the delta n, and this will be p equals essentially delta p. But delta n equals delta p because this is this is ionization due to heat. So the extra down here is the delta p. The extra up here is delta n. And I have, this is my n sub d, these. So n is n sub d plus the delta, the augmentation due to the ionization. The holes are also this. And as it gets hotter, uh, uh, and, and delta n and delta p are equal to each other. 
So as this gets hotter, this becomes a smaller and smaller fraction of this. And that's why this goes from 10 to the 15 to the 10 to the 17. So in this particular case right here, that data point right there, that is 10 to the 15 plus 10 to the 17 equals uh, 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 17. And what do we have down here? We have 1.00 times 10 to the 17. So these are, by all intents and purposes, equal to each other, right? And so therefore, we actually use the term intrinsic, even though it's doped, because it's lost its doping efficacy. It's no longer, it's no longer behaving as a doped material. It's behaving as an undoped material because N and P are in a one-to-one -one ratio. Yes? So once it reaches a high enough temperature, the, is it that the electrons start popping off the like silicon, for instance, or whatever? The yeah, coil bonds are breaking, yeah. So instead of coming from the holes or P-type or any type, it's coming from the actual crystal itself? Yes, okay. yes. It's not coming from the donors or acceptors, yeah. Yeah, well, the donors and acceptors only did that, that first part. Yeah. What temperature would that typically be? It depends on the band gap, and so that's why there's sort of um, so germanium. Uh, the, 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 the some some semiconductors need to be uh, cooled uh, to operate. Like if you're using mid infrared detectors, you probably need to cryogenically cool them because their band gaps are like 0.3 electron volts. Silicon can operate at room temperature. Germanium. Uh, and, 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 and silicon can clearly operate in the, in the Sahara Desert, but, um, but I wouldn't put it near a combustion engine very close, or I wouldn't put it near a, uh, an aircraft, a jet, you know, a Rolls-Royce or General Electric uh, uh, jet engine, because uh, that's going to get too hot. So, uh, so then the last thing is, we need to have our race up on the sixth floor. How do the carriers move? Well, it's drift and diffusion. And drift is by electric field. Bands tilt. And they move as a function of the electric field driving it. And the, so the key here, so here's the, the key, uh, key point is most current moves by drift to diffusion. Drift is driven by electric field. Drift is dominated by the availability of free carriers. And diffusion is dominated by the concentration gradient. So the higher the slope, the more the current. And so remember, I attach my battery. When the positive voltage pushes this down, the bands tilt. Electrons roll down. Holes roll up. And here's the, through the Einstein relation, you actually see that D and U are actually interrelated through the Einstein relation. And here's, uh, here's uh, Drunkard's Walk, essentially. Uh, I don't know if that's politically correct to say today. Um, and so then you can see the electric field will hurt it. But the, the carriers are scattering, right? They're scattering off the lattice. They're scattering off the phonons. They're scattering off the ionized donors. They're scattering off the ionized acceptors. They're scattering off the point defects, right? So there's all this scattering going on, uh, usually. And you know, this is the Felix Baumgartner effect, right? So it's scattering. It's, it's, it, as it re-enters the atmosphere, it's going to scatter and it'll slow down. So there's going to be an ensemble. There's going to be a an average velocity for electric field which will lead to the mobility. So the mobility is, is a figure of merit for the ability for the carriers to move through. And then, uh, yeah, resistivity. And then the temperature dependent mobility, this is nice. So the temperature dependent mobility uh, is looking at the lattice scattering, which is the phonons. And the impurity scattering, so as it gets cold, uh, the carriers, uh, the electron going past an, impu an ionized impurity, it's going past that ionized impurity very slowly, so it scatters, so its effective mobility goes down. 
And if it gets hotter, there's more phonons, so that also brings it down. So there's kind of a preferred uh, zone. And so I drew this, showing that the uh, as the as the impurity concentration, this, this is the impurity. The, this asymptote is the impurity scattering. So as the impurity gets, uh, don't uh, the don't. Uh, dopants get higher and higher, obviously my impurity scattering gets more and more, and so therefore my mobility drops. This is mobility. So my mobility drops. Um, but I, it's, it's um, the, the phonons is about the same, because that's still the temperature dependent phenomenon. And so here you can see the mobility as a function of temp uh, purity concentration. So the more uh, dopants you put in, the worse the mobility is. And we're almost to the end, right? Hall effect mobility. So you can measure. Hall effect allows you to measure the mobility. And then you get into the high electric fields, the Felix Baumgartner effect, right? So the uh, voltage is, I mean, the voltage, the velocity is linearly dependent on electric field until you get to some point where it's like the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the friction of going through the lattice slows it down. So, and then the last thing is the optical processes, where now we have all these different energy levels, so we can absorb, we can emit. All these different uh, energy levels can now be in play, so we can absorb uh, different photons. And here's the absorption coefficient as a function of, of energy. Uh, so here we, we're absorbing a high energy photon larger than the band gap, so it absorbs, kicks an electron up, it thermalizes down, so what's this process by? It's casting off the phonons, right, so it relaxes down to the energy minimum until it and sits there maybe a, a nanosecond and then it finally relaxes back. And when it does that, it may, might release a photon characteristic of EC minus EV. And so here's the, the uh, absorption as a function of band gap. And so obviously it's basically a window. It's, it's, it's transparent below the band gap. And then alpha is the absorption coefficient, uh, which means it's highly absorbing, so therefore it becomes opaque beyond the band gap. Almost at the end, yeah. So then, based upon all that, you can see the different wavelengths you can get, the different materials. Here's that mid infrared I was talking about. Things that are like 0.3 electron volts. You can see this is such so, so small. You can you can imagine these kind of detectors have to be cryogenically cooled to operate properly. Uh, is this the end, or very 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 close to the end? Carrier trapping. Oh yeah, carrier trapping. So you can have the different levels acting, and that leads to carrier lifetime. Yeah, quasi from levels. But essentially, so the motion of the carriers, and then the very last thing was the. Um, it's really the Heisenberg uncertainty. Uh, I mean the uh, sorry the um, Ang Shockley experiment showing the interrelationship of drift and diffusion of, of, of diffusivity and of mobility through the Einstein relation. So that was the big takeaway here. Okay, let me take a drink of water and, and uh, answer any questions if I, if I haven't exhausted you yet. Can you explain why the electron like trickles down in that uh, figure you showed? <coughs> What causes it to trickle down? Um, really, it's just Mother Nature. Mother Nature wants to re uh, reduce its free energy. So uh, the fact that this electron is uh, up is, a, is means it's an excited state for that electron. It's got a lot of energy. It's like throwing a it's like throwing a ball up into into uh, uh, space, you know, and so it's, it hits its parabola, and then eventually gravity will pull it back down. So 
it will, you know, if you excite it, if you stimulate it with light, with heat, with, uh, with a PN junction injecting, you can get it up into this excited state, but given it enough time, it will relax back down to its ground state. It wants to come back to its home. Right? We all want to round first, second, third base, come home. We all want to go home for Thanksgiving, see our family. Uh, right, so it just wants to reduce its free energy. Questions? Yes? If all goes well, when do you think the beginning part of this will be available? Right? The oh, um, because this is not uh, such a clean, multiple choice, multiple guess, uh, a short answer, this is a little more involved. It takes me a minimum a week to digest these uh, and grade them. Uh, is that your question? I was going to make the video when I can watch the Oh, video. <laughs> okay. I don't know. We'll do our best. Um, um, and so uh, I was hoping to possibly, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm borrowing someone's SD chips, so I'll have to talk to Hu Cheng uh, after class. But. Uh, I was originally hoping, because I got a camera without an SD card, uh, I was originally going to uh, put it on my hard drive and then start the, the upload to YouTube and uh, go home and uh, then check it uh, later tonight and see if it finished. YouTube does a conversion and that sometimes takes a little while. Um, and so then once, it, once YouTube digests it, they release a, a link. And then from that link, I could post that on Carmen. Certainly by tomorrow morning, if there's no hiccups with the video, certainly by tomorrow morning, uh, I would have it so that you would have uh, it, it's, uh, this all, all Thursday during the day. So. Any other questions? Yes? I remember you mentioning, I don't know if you mentioned this during this session, but that uh, there was the one chart that had all the different band gaps of all the different yeah. materials, and I think you mentioned that they all have to be pretty close. To, yeah, that one. They all have to be pretty close to each other. Like two of them have to be close to each other to be able to do, produce hmm. the alloy. Yeah, I was saying that earlier about the misfit dislocations. Yeah, yeah. So, so like I can easily put gallium arsenide and, and aluminum arsenide together, but I'm going to have more difficulty putting um, gallium. Gallium indium arsenide phosphide on top of a of a gallium arsenide substrate, right? It's it's like if I'm trying to hit some infrared uh, uh, photon here, I'm trying to hit some yellow photon here, then it's not going to lattice match that gallium arsenide. So Is that based only on the difference in lattice constant? Or also? Yes. Okay. Yeah, lattice constant. So then that's that's why I dragged you through the crystallography. Yes. Crystallography is very important. If you can't build it, then it doesn't matter how much you imagine it. And some of these are non-trivial to synthesize or, or put on top of each other. Yes? Is the effective mass about like when, um, is it important when knowing the difference between like the negative and the positive? For the effective mass, like, is uh, is it when the particle is moving towards the electric field that you have a negative effective mass? Uh, so this is a. Uh, uh, this is why I showed this as your first slide. This is a p-type transistor, so this is conducting holes. P-type because it's positive. This is n-type because it's negative, so it's con uh, transmitting uh, electrons. So uh, this is uh, transmitting the holes in the valence band, and the n-MOS is transmitting the electrons in the conduction band. And so then the, the curvature of that is being manipulated by this stress and strain, by the compression and tension. So this was, was uh, modified 
and it created this the heavy hole, light, heavy hole, light hole. And what ended up happening is as I did the uh, compression, what ended up happening is the light hole came up. And, and so this became a light hole. So the, light, so the valence band transport was dominated now by the light hole. So the effective mass basically dropped. So I had a lighter effective mass. The holes are much lighter. And therefore, my uh, P, P MOSFET was a faster device. And similarly, this went from something that was more bowed to, uh, to something that was a little more parabolic, uh, I mean a little more narrower. And so it, it moved in. And by doing so, its effective mass also dropped a minuscule amount, maybe 10%, 15%. But that's enough to maybe get you to the next node in the uh, Moore's Law generations. So that's because it has a stronger curvature? Is. Yes, because the effective mass is inversely relation, related to the curvature. Yeah. And remember, the guy that pioneered this is Robert Chow, you know, Ohio State alum. He was director of transistor development at uh, Intel at the time. I think he did his experiments up on the second or third floor of Caldwell for his PhD. Okay. Questions? Okay, clear as mud. Okay, I will uh, uh, see you on Friday then. So we don't need to know about that. Um, yeah, I wasn't, this isn't gonna, I got enough material, so his question was about the process, about beams hitting silicon, and I'm just sure he's talking about growth or the uh, x-ray. The last few slides of the first thing. Oh, the last few slides of the first thing? You got me there. Oh, this is the growth, okay. Yeah, I just, you need to know that there's uh, different types of growth and, and that I have these different epitaxies, but I'm going to uh, fixate more on things like uh, uh, how you, you know, the, the, how you stack these and do the, what we were just talking about, the, the misfit and the being able to grow anything on anything. That's the more important takeaway. This isn't a process class, but you got to know that the crystal can be synthesized before you can actually make a device from it. Okay. Thank you. And thank your classmate for helping uh, do the videography. I really deeply appreciate it. So. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very overly simplified one-dimensional solution, and a really more rigorous three-dimensional solution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's just the manifestation of the actual damage structure. So the curvature is related to its effective mass, but why do the effective mass vary? It's just, it's just nature. They just end up with these two bands. And this is this is what engineers, this is what Intel engineers, TSMC engineers, Samsung engineers, and the rest of it. This is what we're going to be doing. Yes. Yes, like uh, light hole, uh, they, 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 they separate from each other and the light hole can pop up under compression. <coughs>